and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. I am Illegal86, joined here by Nerd Bomber and Tactic to bring you the latest summer spectacular in the podcast world. Uh, is it summer yet? Well, not, not technically, but it's it's basically summer, right? Are we, is it summer? Can we declare it summer? It's summer when we decide that we're going outside more. And guys, we are out of hibernation. Okay, so it's summer. You heard it here first. It's summer. Go outside. Get some sunshine. Get some allergy medication if you're if you're allergic to things. That I feel like we D. talked about allergies. Claritin D. I think we talked about allergies at the beginning of the last show, but they're still going on. So yeah, they're a very uh, real thing still. If you have Claritin stocked up, don't don't give up on it. Keep keep it close. We're going to be talking about a number of exciting things today. We're going to be talking about Marvel Snap. We got a trailer for that and some gameplay footage. We're going to take you through that. We're going to be talking about the latest big blockbuster trailers to hit the web, including a trailer for a brand new Disney Plus television show and the trailer for what I think is going to be the biggest movie of 2023. We'll get to that more a little bit later. But uh, first, how are you guys doing? How's good. life? Are you good. Are you centered? Very uh, good. I'd say that I'm tilted to the left a little bit. I always, I can never the remember. The What's the left brain versus the right brain? Which one is more the, the creative? Left, the left brain is the creative brain. I'm like 99% sure. And I think like, are left-handed people more creative? What, what do we know about left? Because like, I, I saw a plot the other day, by the way. This is a total offshoot. I thought left-handed you know, people like, are more right-brained. Hey, that may be versa. true. I, I just, I, the reason I thought of it is I saw a plot the other day on twitter which is a dangerous place to see plots let me let me just state that right out of the gate but it showed like the prevalence of left-handedness over the years and like how much it's gone up which is like pretty drastic i don't remember the exact numbers on it but like you know i buy that though i feel like we used to beat it out of people when they were little back in like the 70s and 80s and probably even well before that because wasn't left-handed considered back in like I'm thinking now colonial America times. Wasn't it like a sign of the the devil devil or something? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the Latin for, isn't the Latin for right and left like Dexter and sinister or something? So like sinister is literally like, just like. Can you imagine being a a, a rebellious teen and being like, guys, guys, I'm going to write this memoir with my left hand. (laughs) I'm write a memoir as a teenager. Uh, Yeah. I, I do wonder if it's like persecution or if it's like. It could be like genetic. It could just be like blossoming out of some genetic mutation that's, you know, further geneticizing. I have no idea. Uh, But it's interesting to think about. And it's one of the many interesting things to think about that's showing up on Twitter. Shout out to Twitter. Shout out to our Twitters. Uh, At OW Illegal 86, at OW Technic, at OW Nerd Bomber, and our main show account at Online Warriors 1. Go, uh, Go hit us up there. Talk about anything that you hear on today's episode. Let's talk. I, I'm I'm too excited. Let me just start there. I'm too excited to talk about our next topic. I may, if my if my speech gets stumbly, or if I sound out of breath, it's because I probably am. Guys, however you feel about Tom Cruise and his COVID outbursts, and just like generally like the Scientology and like just generally the person that he is, because I know a lot of people have issue with that. My fiance being one of them. Uh, however you feel about him as a person. There is no one making movies like Mission Impossible right now. There's just no one doing it. There's no, like, did you guys see Mission Impossible Fallout? No. I think, no, I think we did. Didn't we see a Mission Impossible with you at a drive-in, like, years ago, and I fell asleep because it was, like, the third movie, and I, like, tapped out. It was not the third movie. I saw the third movie in theaters. I wasn't at a drive-in. I saw the no, I saw not, Fallout not the, in theaters. not the third Mission Impossible. It was, like, the third movie in oh. our lineup at the drive-in because they stacked Well, movies. it wasn't... Yeah, it wasn't Fallout. So Fallout, for those that don't remember, Fallout was the movie that took down Movie Pass officially. It was the last movie I tried to see with Movie Pass, and they started blacking it out because too many people were trying to see it. That should tell you how good it was. Mission Impossible Fallout was one of the better movies that I saw that I've seen in the past few years. It's right up there with like Knives Out. Just amazing movie, end to end. Best action movie I've ever seen. Maybe the best action movie I will ever see. So. I'm a big fan of the Mission Impossible franchise. The new trailer for Dead Reckoning Part 1 came out. So the the, the next two movies are going to be in a two-part format. I believe it's either the end of the franchise in total or the end of Tom Cruise being in it or the end of Chris McQuarrie directing it. He's the current director. He also directed movies like Edge of Tomorrow, which also stars Tom Cruise. 
And I think he did one of the Jack Reacher movies as well. He's done a number of things with uh, with Tom Cruise. Before we get into um, the movie, I have to ask you guys, yeah. how do you feel about the broken up movie format? Because I know we've seen this happen like in a lot of I want to talk movie about adaptations. But like, th- I think this is the first time we're getting because Mission Impossible is not based on books, right? Or if it was like they deviated not. a long time ago. So like, how do you feel about Th- theoretically, that? Theoretically, well, so 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 Mission Impossible is based on a television show from like the 60s originally. I don't know. Like, it's not. I wouldn't say it's heavily based on it at this point. At this point, it's pretty much its own thing. I think. Um, I was actually just talking to a friend about this today uh, about the two movie format. Is it like the part one, part two thing? My overarching opinion on it, though not a strong opinion, is that it's problematic. It's it's indicative of editing issues. Like to me, and, and I, I think it's more more so for like books or something like something that has a, a firmer source material. But if you're making two movies out of one book, that means that you left too much in the movie and not enough went to the cutting room floor. That's like that to me. That's my maybe that's too harsh. But I will immediately worry more about pacing issues. And things like that. Now, granted, with Mission Impossible, there's really no such thing as pacing issues. If you watched the sixth movie, you know what I'm talking about. You basically can't catch your breath for the entire yeah. movie. Well, all of them are just fast, 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 fast. It, it, extremely fast paced, nonstop, doesn't let up until until the credits roll. So not really an issue here, but I would say the model to be followed here, if I were the Mission Impossible folks, or if I was any... If I was in this situation where I was making a two-part movie that was not based on a book or something, just give it two different... Do what, do what the MCU did. To me, Infinity War and Endgame are basically one story told over two parts. They did it the right way. They did not call it Infinity War Part 1 and Infinity War Part 2. They called it Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, if I was Mission Impossible, I would pick like... I don't know, two different titles. I don't, I mean, I don't think Dead Reckoning is a particularly good title too. Like, I don't think that's pretty good. I don't think that's a particularly good title at all. So I would just throw that out there as well. But I wouldn't go with a part one, part two. I think that's a dangerous notion. And I don't know if you brought that up because you agree or you disagree or if it's just a food for thought kind of thing, but a kind of a food for thought thing, but also like I just, because it's not based on source material, like you said, I don't understand why you don't just do two different titles. Because Dead Reckoning means absolutely nothing to anybody seeing these movies right now. Well, so Mission Impossible is kind of an interesting case for this because, you know, if you watched, you know, the first three movies, or really the first four movies, they are pretty much completely disconnected. Like there are some common characters like Ving Rhames has been in basically every single one, I think. And obviously Tom Cruise has been in every single one, but there's really no continuity to be worried about. There's no plot that goes over multiple movies that you need to worry about. Now around four, five and six, that started to change drastically where now, and and this trailer kind of alludes to the same sort of thing happening. There is a continuous thread that you need to keep a track, keep track of. And, you know, getting into what this trailer does. Have you guys seen any of the mission impossible movies? Did you just see the one that you fell asleep <laughs> at the drive in with me watching it? Cause if so, you're probably really confused watching this trailer. I personally am not a big Mission Impossible person. I've seen a few of the movies, but a long time ago. And then the one that I like saw in bits and pieces around a sleepy big bucket of popcorn. Mm. So there is a character in this trailer who's talking. There's very little dialogue in this trailer, first of all, which I think was a good choice. But the dialogue you get is a character named Kittredge talking to Tom Cruise in what looks like just a totally white room. I don't know where they are. doesn't really matter at this point. That character, Kittredge, is a character from the first movie, the very first Mission Impossible that came out like way back in the 90s. And he, he him and, and Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt were in prob- the most famous scene of that movie, which you're, you're, you might be aware of. I don't know how common, I don't know how far it gets outside of like Mission Impossible fandom, but it's like, I would say one of the more famous scenes of the franchise you know it's not a set piece so people might not be as aware of it but it's a fantastic scene very suspenseful kittredge basically accuses ethan hunt of being a mole and they're kind of recreating that 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 tenseness here which i really loved and then you're kind of just off from there into just banana set piece after set piece fighting a lot of tom cruise running i will say i think tom cruise has finally lost a step he's not running as fast and he looks old like i i i in these movies he is great uh i wouldn't say i love tom cruise but in these movies and i'm a a fan of some of his other movies as well i like the jack reacher movies 
it's time. It's time. Like I, in it's one of these movies, it's unbelievable. Is, that that's always my problem. Yeah. When you have these action stars that are getting older in age, it's just becoming a little unbelievable. And I'm not saying that they can't do the stunts because obviously Tom Cruise still does all of his own stunts. But like, I don't know how old is he now. He is in his sixties. I be- I will say in Fallout, he sold it. I didn't. I did not think he had lost a step at all in Fallout. I thought in Fallout he was very good. He was still very game for everything that he did, which was you know, in these kinds of movies, it's a lot. You're doing a lot. He's doing all his own stunts, like you said. I mean, it's heck. In Fallout, he jumped out of the plane. I'm gonna Google how old Tom Cruise is because I don't want to. I don't want to get it wrong, but I would guess right around 60 years old. Tom Cruise is 59 years old. I was basically there. 59 years old. It's starting to show. I, I know think, for the I'm first time. 30, and I feel like. I couldn't, uh, I mean, I never could do these stunts, but I feel like I can't even do some of the stuff I was doing five years ago. So like, it's just, it's getting a little tougher to believe. And again, obviously he's doing a lot of his own stunts, but I feel like at some point, maybe is he clinging on too long and needs to like pass the torch and kind of fades into a different part of his career? This might be blasphemous. Well, there's context there. So there are a lot of people who think, and I I think it was rumored at the time and maybe even floated, but then given how the movie did, they decided not to do it. You may remember that in, I think it was four and five, uh, Jeremy Renner was in two movies and there were people who were thinking, okay, they're Oh, wasn't he supposed to take over? Well, yeah, people were thinking he was, they were going to pass the torch to him. And then, I don't know, something happened that we don't really know about is, is, is my guess. And he decided not to do it or they decided they didn't want him. But yeah, in four and five, he played a pretty major role and people were thinking, okay, he's going to be the next the next guy. But he, he's also um, kind of old. Why wouldn't they do someone young? He's not that old. How old is Jeremy uh, Renner? He's probably 40. Let me, let me see how old Jeremy Renner is. Jeremy Renner age. Jeremy Renner is 51. Okay, so yeah, he's pretty old. Jeremy Renner, you look good for your age. You need like a tech tech in the role. I'm telling you, I'll, I'll get in shape. I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. You, I don't know who you need necessarily. It's I, I, so my opinion is they should just shut the franchise down after Tom Cruise is done. I think in one of these next two movies, probably the second part two of it, he will die. Um, and that's how it's going to end. That'd be my is guess. Is he going to do that? His um, own stunt in that one or no? Oh, you like, like a death stunt. Yeah. I don't know, it's, it's possible. <laughs> Tom Cruise is pretty off the wall, dude. I, you know, this, the stunts are obviously one thing, but, something i want to draw attention to that you know i'm sure when i saw fallout if we were doing the podcast at the time i'm sure i just gushed about the movie and for the past few movies and since christopher mcquarrie took over as director what they've been doing and they and they they talk about this i've listened to podcasts about it and, and read a lot about it when they start shooting these mission impossible movies they really don't have a script and it's not to say they're they're Mission Impossible movies have plot, but the plot is typically very secondary to the set pieces, right? So what they do is they just kind of jet set all over Europe and South America and various places in search of cool locations to shoot. So, for example, at the end of this trailer, Tom Cruise rides a bike off of a off a cliff, basically, and he like base jumps, basically. They they scouted locations and they found that hillside and thought, this looks epic. This looks incredibly cool. We're going to use this for a set piece. Tom's going to do something. And we don't know what it is yet, but he's going to do something significant here. And they say, okay, we got that. Let's move to the next place. And they kind of just like build locations. And when they have a, a list of locations, then they build the movie. And it's a very interesting way to do it. It sounds kind of backwards. It sounds like it shouldn't work at all. But the proof is in the pudding. The results speak for themselves. Mission Impossible Fallout was one of the best movies ever when it came out. But I would say it's the best action movie ever. I think it's like right there with like... My whole problem with the franchise as a whole. So every single movie has a mission, correct? Well, so the movies, they, they all kind of blend together. Tom Cruise, spoiler alert, but Tom Cruise typically the IMF gets infiltrated and he has to like work outside of the confines of the IMF and off in the law to like get something done. But he gets it done? The gist of it. Well, yeah. Okay, so in every single film, there was this mission that he completely completed. You're saying it should be called Mission Possible. I mean, it should be called Mission at least (laughs) pretty likely. (laughs) I can see where you're going with this. But the point is, it it, it seems impossible at the beginning. That's like the whole premise. I don't want to argue about the title with you. I'm going to quote a mentor of mine that I need to really have a sit down with Tom Cruise. 
Don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. Tommy boy. Tell me what you can do. Tom Cruise. I mean, the, the, the thing about it, there, there are certain things that like, again, f- feel however you want to about Tom Cruise. Cause I'm certain you could feel any particular way about him. He is doing like the fact that he's doing all the driving, the fact that he is doing the jumping out of the plane, the fact that he is doing the base jumping, the fact that, you know, two movies ago, he was hanging onto the side of a plane as it took off. There are certain things that you, that like, we're going to talk about CGI later, spoiler, spoiler alert, CGI, there's always going to be an unreal element to it and him doing all of these things and allowing them to get shots that you would never be able to get if you had a stunt double and you had to do a wide shot, like it adds so much to these movies and even this trailer, it adds a lot to this trailer. Just the fact that he's doing all of it. I can't stress enough how important that is for this franchise. I think this is going to be the best movie of 2023. I would, I mean, he I would, has especially to go with the downturn with, with the precedence. Sure. Definitely. Well, that's the thing. They have to keep topping themselves. And I would say with what I feel is the downturn of Marvel, it, there's really, this is the be- going to be the best movie of the next year. And I don't think it's going to be even close. So uh, consider that a tactic prediction made by me, but I want it to be called the tactic prediction because he gets a lot of predictions, right? Are you guys interested in getting in on Mission Impossible at all? Because boy, I'm so, I'm so excited for you if you ever do decide to watch it. They're so good. If I had to invest in a Tom Cruise film, it's going to be Top Gun. It's it's not going to be Mission Impossible. Top Gun's played out. Top Gun. Here, I, I'm glad you brought up Top Gun because I think Top Gun will do okay. The eightiesness of Top Gun is too much. It's too much in it, and like not in a cool disagree. like stra- Stranger Things way. I disagree. Have you looked at like fashion and stuff lately? And even just like things that are trendy now are things that are like from the 90s and the 80s and all that kind of stuff. So like that era is back in fashion. So I think even just inherently because it was an 80s, 90s movie. I don't remember when the first one came out, but just because of the era in which it came out and what's kind of being revived right now, I think it'll have a decent show in for people. I suppose I can get behind that. I just... Mission Impossible has so much more appeal. Top Gun is is very niche. Mission Impossible, I think, is it's going to draw in a larger audience. Top Gun might be fine. I didn't think the first Top Gun was feels all that bet good. worthy. Throwing that out there, this definitely feels bet worthy. I would, I'll, I'll, I'll bet on this. I would bet on this. I bet, I bet a chocolate bar on this. You're in. Uh, you're on it. You're, you're on. I'm on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had a friend in college who would always make chocolate bar bets with us. Firestorm five hundred one, formerly of the Nerdbomber podcast. Well, there you go, chocolate bar bet placed on Mission Impossible seven. I should probably find out when this is coming out. It's it's twenty twenty three. I know that it is slated to come out July fourteenth, twenty twenty three. I mean, this is summer blockbuster nation right here. So, see, he's heavily invested in the action adventure crowd, whereas I'm heavily invested in the thirsty older woman crowd. I was I was going to say crowd. I was going to say militaristic boomer crowd. <laughs> you, you you went a different way, but either way it might be successful. Also, shout out to Haley Atwell, who's in this. I think she needs to be in more. And I'm, I was glad to see her in this. Tom Clementif also in this. They're gathering people. And I, and I, I think it's, I think it's just great. So Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. Coming next year. You know what? I want to talk about, we're just going to, we're going to stay in the movies and TV realm so we can talk about, I'm projecting my opinions on this right away, but how bad they're going to mess up She-Hulk. <laughs> um, I don't guys, mind the premise, but the CGI it, it was terrible. It was hard terrible. to watch. It's not watchable. I agree the premise is fine, if not good. It's not watchable. It's just li- like Tatiana Maslany, great actress. And I wish they would let her face be on screen, unadulterated by whatever the heck... <laughs> we're, we're seeing here i mean it's like it's uncanny valley it's like it's 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 cringe town usa so do you have a problem with bruce banner's hulk i do not you? i think there's a reason for that okay so i actually know the difference between the two so bruce banner's okay. hulk doesn't look humanistic like he has human elements but he very clearly is not a regular human you know like yeah, this is correct this is what i was going to say too this is correct I yeah think. but go, go, go on she hulk however isn't that big doesn't look that much different she's just green 
and very tall and muscular. And what I don't understand is why they didn't just go the prosthetics route with this. Put her in some stilts or something like that, you know, to give her some height. I guess then they couldn't do like the stiletto heel lawyer thing. But like costume designers are very good. They can figure it out. Put her in some kind of like, yeah, height thing. Paint her green. Make it real. And well, as real as it can be. And just let it ride like that. You know, if she doesn't look muscular enough, put her in some muscle suit. Prosthetics look very realistic these days. They could have done such a better job. And instead we have a CGI abomination, which looks like a bad video game from like the 2000s, the th- early 2000s. I think there's a reason for this, um, the way that the direction they went. And well, first and foremost... A good the, reason yeah. or a bad reason? No, there's a good reason. So She-Hulk has very different variations of She-Hulk, no different than Bruce Banner, where, you know, there's the, there's her normal self, then there's the sort of sexy She-Hulk, and then there's the next step because the thing about her and that's really different than keep in mind the original Bruce Banner is we're seeing her go right into a controlled version of herself. And what we see there is the professor Hulk version. Right. Basically what we're seeing there is a smaller petite version of even Bruce Banner. So what we're seeing here is she goes right to that phase. She goes right to the control. And the reason why she is the way she is and why she looks human like is because this isn't her rage form. Well, or, that's fair, but then to my point, put her in pros- be- yeah. put her in prosthetics and make it look but more real. But she has to scale relative to Bruce Banner. They okay, they've okay, set the then, size precedence, so she has to be the size and, and shape that right, she but is. But if you look at her in this trailer, she's not that much bigger. Like she picks that guy up and maybe she's got like an extra 4 or 5 feet, but again, put her in you know, some kind of like height adjusting boot thing and well, do a good right. job with prosthetics. And then when she goes into rage form, that's when you bust out the CGI because she looks different enough. I'll, I'll go a step further and say a lot of the things. And, and look, we know why they did it this way. CGI costs less money. You, you can see in like there, you, that still went around from uh, Spider-Man No Way Home they use CGI when they really didn't need to. I don't want to get into like plot spoilers in case people haven't seen No Way Home yet, but there's like a very specific scene towards the end with Spider-Man and, and Happy Hogan that you probably have seen. It's just like, I'll take it a step further though, what you were saying, Nerd Bomber, and say that like, I don't even think they need prosthetics. I don't think like so much of what that what they're doing here, they can do with forced perspective and taking advantage of the fact that, yeah, the regular Hulk is full CGI. You can allow tatiana maslany to like act and like be her human form in so many other ways and they're just opting not to do that and it's very frustrating to me because i think it could be good well like and a good example I'm, of the force perspective thing and like halo captain america he, well that's too, is one but, but yeah a, a more recent like kind of and i know halo has a lot of cgi issues itself And it had mixed reviews, but I think it did a really good job with Master Chief and, you know, with the Force perspective, when it's just him, yeah, he doesn't look like a massive dude, but then when he's walking through a crowd, the way that they kind of force the camera work, he looks like a bigger guy than he actually is. And I think, like you said, they could have done that here and it would have worked. Right. And it's, you know, it's harder to do. You have to to do set design very specifically and there's a lot you have to do, but... It would just like, and I'm sure Nat right now they're thinking that because this trailer has gotten a lot of backlash for the quality of the CGI and uh, rightfully so, I think. Like, I, I don't, for me, between the my experience with Moon Knight and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, like, I'm down on Marvel to begin with. I laughed when I was watching this. Like, I just, I don't think it's going to happen for me. And at this point, considering the thin ice that they're already on for me, the CGI is enough for me to be like, okay, I'm not interested. Like someone may like it. A lot of people might like it, but I just, I'm not sure I'd be able to take it seriously. And I'm in a place with Marvel where I'd like to still be able to do that. And they're not letting me. (laughs) It's kind of where I'm at with them. I will say though, the attorney at law thing, the superhuman law aspect of this is interesting. I would like to see them lean into that a little bit. I don't know to what extent that fits into like the She-Hulk canon from the comics. But I think that's an interesting angle that they could potentially exploit. Whether they will do that, I don't know. 
I hope they don't opt for all the like Tinder jokes. That was weird. <laughs> I don't know how I felt about that. It just like... Well, her character is heavily focused on the justice side of things. So I think you will be pleasantly surprised from that angle. It's just, you just gotta, you just gotta tough out the CGI. Hopefully they improve it. And hopefully it makes sense when my prediction is correct, where that she's going to have a bigger, more or less Candy Valley version of herself. I would like that. I, I mean, you might be right. They might be holding that close to the vest until, you know, the penultimate or last episode you know, to really bring that out. But until then, there's got to be a better way <laughs> to like go about this. I just, I don't know. It seems like not the best to me. Now, the follow-on question is, would you let her hold you? Oh, uh, yeah. Why not? Yeah, I feel a, like that'd be nice. That. So, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, which is the full title of it, comes out on August 17th, 2022. Be on the lookout for that. That's That's where I'm at with that. Not much more to say other than that. Wow, the CGI is bizarre let us know what you thought of that one hit us up on twitter i mentioned our handles at online warriors one is our main show account you gonna watch she hulk can you get past the cgi do you think the cgi is all that bad are we just wrong about this let us know in the meantime we're going to take a short break to shout out a sponsor but before we do that i would be remiss if i did not shout out our fantastic patreon producer mr stephen keller stephen you're coming on the show next week spoiler alert stephen's gonna be on the show he's gonna chat with us We're going to have a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. He may stay undefeated in the quiz realm. We will see. That's that's maybe the juiciest running storyline of the upcoming episode, but stay tuned for more on that. Steven supports us at the highest of our three levels of support on Patreon. That is the night level. As a result, he gets this producer shout out every episode. He gets input into our weekly game segment, and he, of course, gets access to the monthly secret segment and vlog, as well as the occasional guest spot, which, as I mentioned, he will be availing himself of next week there is also a squire level of support which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog and there's a page level which gets you access to the monthly secret segment so for more details on any and all those levels of support you can head over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast check out the details there consider giving back to the show consider saying hi to steven and to us and uh getting yourself a sweet sweet set of perks thanks again to steven we'll be right back to talk a little bit more about marvel snap Let's see, Alex. Uh, what do you think of Jaws, which is at 97% Rotten Tomatoes? I find it to be anti-shark propaganda. What do you feel about the Entourage movie, which is at a meager 33%? I think they finally got Hollywood right. How about It Follows, 97%. Worse than your parents giving you the sex is evil talk. How do you feel about Juno, which is at 94%? That would be a movie that celebrates a teenage homewrecker. Uh, how about Bewitch at 25%? Best television adaptation ever put to film. How do you feel about American Hustle? The towering 93%. Overwrought awards bait. Righteous Kill, 19%. The movie that Michael Mann wishes he had made when he created Heat. Sounds about right. I'm Julio. I'm Alex, and we are the Contrarians. As you can tell, our thing is that we rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. Regardless of what we really feel. Find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn. Facebook, Twitter, we're everywhere. All right, we are back to talk about Marvel Snap. So Marvel Snap, I always got called Marvel Snap for a second there. It's a Marvel, Marvel snack, snap, if you ask me. It's a Marvel Snack mobile and PC game. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mobile game? Come on. That, that's, I will say, that's my immediate reaction. Anytime there's a game that's touting itself as a mobile game, I immediately shift to I don't care mode. Let me just start by saying that. However, it is on PC. There is a trailer for this. That is about a minute and a half long that I watched that isn't, it's, it's not really indicative of what the game is. <laughs> Let me just start by saying that. Yeah, the announcement watch, trailer was more of like a animated sizzle reel. sizzle reel, but it didn't show anything of the game. It's it, If you watch this trailer, you would think that it's like a 3D adventure action game of some yeah. sort, and this is not. It's a really cool game. art style, and like a, if, if you want to see how good animation can be, like go look at that. The art department's really working overtime on that one. No, this is a collectible card game. I mistakenly, before the episode, called it a deck builder and was soundly chastised. So I'm going to turn it over to Nerd Bomber to take us through the details and explain to me why it's not a deck builder and why it's going to be a big deal. 
Well, there is an element of building a deck, but it's more building a deck as you would Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh!, any of those type of card games where you're collecting cards. It's pronounced Pokemon, but but continue. (laughs) But it's more like you're collecting cards in the game and then you can build your own custom deck based on the cards that you've collected. And there, I don't really know a whole lot about the mechanics because they didn't really dig too deep into how the mechanics would work. However, the overarching gameplay is, was really interesting to me here. So first of all, they really honed in on the fact that jumping into a game would be super easy. You just hit play now and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. You're just put into a game. The games, they said, are going to be like three minutes-ish and there's no downtime. So like a traditional card game, you're playing with somebody, you know, you make a move, then you wait while they make a move and so on and so forth until the game ends. In this game, instead, there's basically overlapping gameplay. So you're moving while your opponent moves and there's really no wait time at all, which I think is actually really frenetic, but also very interesting because I don't think I've seen a card game quite like that before. I don't know. I know, Illegal, you're really big into board games and card games. I don't know if you've seen anything like that, but typically for a card game, it is a little bit more turn-based and I don't think I've ever seen anything that's not. So there's, there's one other thing that you didn't mention that I really want to mention. In the phrase of deck building, typically in these deck building games, you're basically surmounting this massive deck of of stacked cards. And this is nowhere near that because your deck caps out at 12 cards in what you're playing into a game. And that's that's sort of what allows it to be so quick and moving is, is your deck is just 12 cards. And I was, I've been thinking about this a lot and how can they do this where it's simultaneously working because, you know, distractions happen, you can look away. And th- that would kind of inhibit the outcome of the game if it's something that you should be constantly doing. So I think, in, in my theory of the way that they're doing this, is you roll out your 12 cards in a particular order and they stack on each other based on that order. And so both people play out their cards and it's sort of a random thing, I think. And then as you're watching, you can sort of up the ante or not. I don't know. What do you guys think? That's the only way that I can conceivably see it as possible and and seamless amongst all people. Well, it seemed like from the gameplay video that there were three different hubs or areas that you had to try to gain control of over your opponent. So I think it's more where are you directing those 12 cards and in what order are they necessarily coming up and how you want to allot them and what cards maybe you group together in each area. Like I said, they didn't really go too deep into the gameplay details themselves and the rules of the game but they did kind of show that like overarching gameplay and there was a lot of just like action happening it seemed like they had a lot of like attack animations or something like that or like magical effects for the various characters so there it did seem like there was always something happening on the playing field right well so yeah i I do i don't play a lot of collectible card games i don't i don't do pokemon i don't do magic pokemon sorry but I do play a lot of board games. I do play a decent amount of deck building games. And what I can say is that downtime is the enemy of any good board game. It can be mitigated and minimized very effectively, but it's very hard to do. And I've seen both successful home runs and total swings and misses at doing so. It's, you know, I think the best way to manage downtime is to make it such that the downtime has utility. If, if, If there is a time at which a player is doing something that you can also be doing something, it no longer is downtime. You may not be playing any cards or actually doing anything, but you're thinking about what the next move is. If the game can get you, can trick you into actively doing that, even when you're not playing cards or you, or you can't play cards, then there's no more downtime. So that's kind of a meta point, but that's that's what I would say as far as, you know, h- how how they might manage that. It's It's interesting to me, you know, I guess we talked a couple weeks ago, I think, about Squirrel Girl, Marvel's new podcast, and I kind of, I kind of said, Marvel has no more worlds to conquer. Basically, they, they're, they're in movies, they're in TV shows, they're in podcasts, they're in video games, collectible card games. I, I want to know, you know, if you guys think, because you guys, you guys, Pokemon. I don't think either of you magic. I know people that magic. I magicked for a little bit. Is there space in this market? Is there space in this sphere of influence? for them to expand and, and to carve out 
something with staying power because you know think about when you think about how big of a phenomenon pokemon was and pokemon was kind of this three-pronged thing i just want to say one of my first thoughts when i saw this trailer was it really sucks that their cards that you're collecting are exclusively digital and they're not doing a parallel release of a card game a physical card game because the art style is amazing right i i guess you know where Pokemon started, with uh, what their, where their audience was, they're now predominantly adults. People our age, you know, probably at the median. There's still obviously plenty of kids that play it. There's plenty of adults that play it. Probably plenty of adults that collect the cards. Probably not as many as there are kids that collect the cards. Is this something for, like, what is the next Pokemon? Is kind of like the, the question that, that this is leading me to. Is a Marvel CCG the next pokemon like pokemon was this trifecta of like they had the the video games and the cards and the tv show marvel has tv show video games movies like can they add a collectible card game to this that can establish some momentum i think it would be very easy even from their their digital plan and footprint and what they're planning to do with the cards so first of all i do want to mention it is free to play and they made a point of saying that you could eventually get every card just by playing but it would probably take forever but one of the things that I really liked, and you've touched on the art style a lot, Illegal, but they are also planning on doing, you know, card collections of specific artists. So if you have an artist that did a specific Avengers run, for example, you could get the heroes in that artist's art style. And you could choose, like, if you wanted to have, like, a pixelated version from, like, a game of all of the different Avengers or heroes in the Marvel Universe, they would have that as an option. And having all of these different runs basically and if this game does kind of pick up steam here and gets a good following i don't see why they couldn't pivot because one of the i think the hardest parts of creating a card game and i've never done so but i I remember when i was a kid i i don't know if you guys ever had this phase but i was like oh you know like i love pokemon i want to make my own my own like game you know and i tried like i cut out all of these pieces of paper out of cardboard and then coming up with the original cards was the hardest part. I mean, outside of like the card mechanics, but I obviously copied that from Pokemon because I was like eight. So what were you expecting from me? But coming up with like the ideas for the cards is the hardest part. But essentially they have this backlog of all of these different characters and villains and even tertiary sidekicks that they can draw from that already exist in a bunch of different art styles, a bunch of different powers, a bunch of different variants why would you not? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have nothing to refute that, nor do I really want to f- refute that. This could be a, a powerhouse. I definitely agree with Tactic that having actual physical cards would be probably, I and mean, they could charge money for those. Dude. It's like that's, I'm sure they'll make money, even though it's free to play, probably ads and things like that. But like, getting people to collect the cards and buy packs of them the old school Pokemon way is probably the quickest way to a buck. And I'm surprised they're not immediately doing that, but. They may just want to roll it out digitally first to see if it if it gets you know the critical mass to make that viable. So yeah, I think we're all relatively in agreement. This could be a very big deal. I don't know when it comes out. It's currently in open or is it in closed beta right now? I believe it's in closed beta right now. Will be available in thirteen different languages on mobile and PC at launch. If I miss something, do we know when it's coming out? <laughs> I, I can't find the details of it anywhere. They did not announce it in their trailer, but soon. And then even sooner on on phone, and then to follow on PC. You heard it here first, folks. Soon, but sooner on phone. So we'll we'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah, so that brings us into what are you up to Wednesday? Yeah, I can can roll out the red carpet here. I can go first. I can say some stuff. I want to talk about two TV shows that I started watching. One an oldie and one a newie. I'll start with the oldie. I think I've started watching this show before, and I didn't get very far. I think it was one of those situations where I didn't, I wasn't in the right place in my life to appreciate it. This was probably like seven, seven years ago, thereabouts, that I started watching Arrested Development on Netflix. And I think I got like three episodes in and I stopped. And now I'm like five episodes in and man, it is great. Did you guys ever watch Arrested Development? Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. It was a little obnoxious for my taste. I watched very, it. I liked it. Tactic did not, so we stopped. It's very like it's it's pretty specific. Like Jason Bateman is an he, he plays a straight man so well, and that's what makes the show go. But there's just there's a lot of just like really funny recurring bits throughout an episode. The episodes are also 20 minutes long, which you don't really see that much anymore, and especially when it's on Netflix with no commercials. Holy cow, you can breeze through them. There's also like not that many seasons. So 
I'm looking forward to kind of just blasting through this as quickly as possible. Relatively traditional as, as comedies go, I would say. The other show, the newie that I'm watching, very untraditional. I can't even tell if I like it yet. It was very weird. Called Our Flag Means Death. So Our Flag Means Death is a pirate comedy on HBO Max hmm? starring Reese Darby. And if you don't know who Reese Darby is, he's that guy from Flight of the Concords who is not one of the two main guys. He's like their manager, I think, in Flight of the Concords. Did you guys start watching this? Have you talk, talked about this on the show before? Am I just remembering that you've started no, watching this? No, we've never watched this. Imagining. So have you watched like What We Do in the Shadows? Nope. Like the, the vampire Taika Waititi. one? No. So, so Taika Waititi, I believe, wrote and directed this. It's New Zealand. It's like it's like Kiwi humor is what I'll call it. So like if you've seen Flight of the Concords and liked it, if you liked What We Do in the Shadows things of that ilk you'll like this a lot it's kind of a dry wit almost like british comedy but also with a little bit more like slapstickiness kind of blended in very character driven there's kind of a just a cast of it's a pirate crew so it's a pirate crew on a ship led by reese darby who plays uh, steed bonnet who apparently is based on a real person who fancied himself a gentleman pirate basically a non-violent pirate who is kind of like he dresses up in fancy clothes and, and stuff like that he pays his crew a regular wage. So they're what they make, what they earn is not dependent on what they pillage. It's just, it's, I think it's all based on like factual historical things, but obviously it's a comedy. So it's, you know, it's, it, they get into a lot of situational humor of like, you know, this pirate captain who's basically inept running a pirate ship. I've only watched one episode, but it was very interesting. We'll almost certainly watch another and I'll report back about how it is. Other than that, just kind of working on fixing up the new house. And almost done with that. I'm probably going to be talking about that less soon, which probably excites me more than it excites you, the listener, but probably excites you too. You're probably sick of hearing about it. So that wraps it up for me. I'll take it over to Tectic. Tectic, what do you got for us? So this was a big weekend for me. I did a lot of different things, a lot of nerdy things, some might call it. But the first thing I want to talk about is I have been talking about it at nauseum, but I finally released the part one of my drone build. So that's available for Patreons. You could see all of the hardware that I used and you could see me just getting right into it, as I say in the beginning of all of my videos. So that's exciting. I'll put that out into the world and then I'll get going on the next part two of software. The next thing that I want to talk about is I started and finished a comic book. It was Avengers Tech On. I had mentioned that I had pre-ordered this forever ago. And when the comic series ended, I got the full volume. And guys, it's like it's like Power Rangers meets Gundam meets Avengers. The art style was great, but the villain arc and and the things that the 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 it was the Red Skull was the villain. The things that the Red Skull did was very Power Rangers esque, where they send this horde, this horde, then big bad guy at the end, and. The story was okay, but the art style was amazing, so I recommend check it out. It was a good time. It was an easy read. I breezed through it in maybe like an hour, so that was fun. And then the last thing, and this is going to ease right into Nerd Bombers, is we watched Chip and Dale. This was really good. Guys, I thought this would be bad. This was really good. Chip and Dale, like, wait, wait. Chip and Dale, like the chipmunks? Like Rescue Rangers, Chip and Dale. Yeah, remember they rebooted it? We talked about the trailer a while back. It is Andy Samberg and... John Mulaney? Yes. Andy Samberg and John Mulaney in it as the voice of Chip and Dale. Do you know who was in it, too? If you haven't seen it, Ugly Sonic. They have put him as an actual staple in society. He's a character that's real, and no one can take him away from us. Essentially, the plot here was they kind of threw Chip and Dale into like a Roger Rabbit sort of world where they are actors, right? You know, like we all know Chip and Dale as their roles in all of the old series and shows and like Rescue Rangers back in the, I think it was the 80s. But basically, we see them as their quote unquote real life characters where they're down on their luck actors. The show came out in the 80s. Nobody really cares about them anymore. And kind of like their hijinks in the world and what kind of gets them back together. Because when the movie starts, they've kind of split up and gone their own separate ways. And it was kind of like a buddy detective movie. Yeah, it was fun for the adults, which is what was interesting. Because at first I thought it was just going to be a playful kid movie. But like 
all of the references to to shows when we were kids and the various internet memes or tropes that they pointed to that, frankly, I don't think young kids would have got, was just the perfect mix of adult humor and kid humor. The humor was the thing that I think was spot on. Like a lot of the references, a lot of the humor did skew kind of adult where I don't think you would have gotten it if you were a kid at all. Like you probably were like, oh yeah, chipmunks, fun. But like they wouldn't have And they have were poking it. fun at, at Seth Rogen, like very ap- apparently. It was just... It was very meta, yeah. Like there was a scene where Seth Rogen obviously plays one of the characters in the, the movie, but because it's meta and that all of the characters in every Disney movie and every movie that you've ever seen kind of exist in this world, but they're actors. All of these Seth Rogen voiced characters kind of pop up on screen and talk to each other. And it's like a very minute thing, but it's just a lot of funny, subtle jokes like that that were really great. I liked it. <laughs> John Mulaney, I would, I would, I feel like I have to just mention he is in the news right now. Have you guys? He's not. He's in the news for some bad reasons right now. Oh no! <laughs> I feel like it'd be What's weird going to, on? Have you not heard what he? Oh, he, uh, he is under fire, and rightfully so. Um, so he's touring right now nationally, and uh, I think it's nationally, and he has surprised a lot of his fans with an opener at a lot of his shows. The opener being Dave Chappelle, who, for those that don't know, Dave Chappelle right now is on a. I don't care what anyone thinks of me to her right now. That is very bad. If you want to know more, just Google like John Mulaney and you're going to see a lot of stuff that you wish you didn't see. But basically Dave Chappelle is like doing openers at John Mulaney shows that are like anti-trans and anti-queer and all kinds of stuff. And it's really bad. So John Mulaney, I, I think I'm still a fan of yours, but man, you gotta, you gotta make some changes because he's also, he's been in the news with him and like him and uh, Olivia Munn had the a girl baby. That he, Olivia Munn, they had a baby, and then he was like, sorry, I'm leaving you. He's just a... Uh, he needs a publicist, <laughs> at, at minimum. Uh, but I'm glad Chippendale was good. Yeah, I'd check it out. It's probably a lot healthier for me to separate the, the art from the artist in, in that instance. I just couldn't help but bring it up because I've been reading a lot about it lately. Anything else, Nerd Bomber? Yeah, so then we watched another movie. So this one, actually, it's been out for a while, but it came out on Paramount+. Plus. This is the Sandra Bullock, Channing Tatum, Brad Pitt movie. This was good. The Lost City. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this looks good. Yeah, this was actually pretty fun. And I feel like it didn't get that much publicity when it came out in theaters. But essentially, so first of all, I do have to say, Sandra Bullock can get it. Can get it. She can get it. Like, I think she's in her late 50s and she looks phenomenal. Not that it even like age doesn't matter. Like, but she also wasn't pulling, she wasn't pulling like Tom Cruise esque stunts either. Like, she was a very realistic person looking her age but she looks great she can still get it she can get it. essentially she is a writer who can get it <laughs> yes a writer <laughs> who basically researched and wrote about this lost jewel on this caribbean island i believe it was and so daniel radcliffe is this rich millionaire who kidnaps her thinking that she can help him locate this hidden artifact because he wants it and channing tatum who is her cover model on all of her romance novels basically comes to her rescue to try to save her. And it was, first of all, I don't think there's a lot of like lighthearted action movies. This gave me like Jumanji with the rock feels, but in a rom-com wrapper. And it was great. I feel like I haven't had a good Sandra Bullock movie in a while. Not that there haven't been good ones. There just haven't really been any Sandra Bullock movies. And this was, this was just fun. It was light. It was funny. There was enough action. It kept you engaged. And I feel like, these were the type of movies that came out a lot in the 2000s, and this is going to make me sound old, but like I'm very nostalgic for this type of movie, and I wish there were more of them. Yeah, back in my day, it was the heyday of film. Well, no, I'm not saying that, but like it just it it kind of almost invokes that campy like mummy feel a little bit, and I liked it. There's not a lot of movies like that right now. I did think it was still in theaters. I thought it was like still. I thought it was doing well, but I thought it was still in theaters. I didn't know it was already like out to rent or watch or whatever. I like Channing Tatum a lot. Mm-hmm. He also has been like relatively quiet. He had like a big streak going and then I feel like I haven't heard from him much. So I'm into it. And I agree with the sentiment that movies aren't what they used to be because I too am old and decrepit. I just, so. I need more campy fun things. I don't need things to take themselves seriously. But then on the other hand, I read a book that was kind of heavy 
So I read The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, and I talked about this a little bit last week, but I've finished it since then. And I I don't want to really get into details because I feel like it's one of those books where you don't want to know a whole lot about it because it's it's really well written in the fact that the way that it unfolds as you read it is just phenomenal. It kind of does this thing where because the the plot of the book that's kind of on the cover, so this isn't too much of a spoiler, is the main character makes a deal with the devil to basically live forever, but everyone forgets who she is. And so she's lived 300 years, and there's this time jump back and forth between the past and the present, and just watching her story unfold and seeing where it takes her at the end of the book, the way that it unfolds is just fantastic. And I'm a huge fan of V.E. Schwab, who wrote the book, and who's written other series that I've read this year. And I would recommend that you check it out. But this book has gotten accolades and has been on like the bestseller list for a while now, I believe, because it came out last year and it is very well deserved. So if you are in the mood for a historical, fantastical sort of fiction book, definitely check this one out. And that is my full recommendation for the week. There you have it, folks. Yeah, I don't know. Take our recommendations. I don't know what to say. I think it'd be a good idea. I am the quiz master this week. So going over the records, I am seven and six. Uh, Tactic six and six. Nerd Bomber five and seven. Uh, Steven, one and oh. Steven looking to maintain his undefeated streak when he comes on the show next week. But in the meantime, I'm going to be quizzing you guys today about Stranger Things. Uh, the next season of Stranger Things set to debut, I believe, later this week. So Yeah. We can dive right into it. I got five questions, all numerical Price is Right style questions, and, uh, you know, a tiebreaker if it's needed. So, given the records, Tectic, you will go first because you have a leg up on Nerd Bomber. I mean, you don't literally, you don't have your leg up on her, at least as far as I know, but that is what I think. Okay. Stranger Things has been on for three seasons. How long, in minutes, is the longest episode of Stranger Things? Uh, I'm I'm leading with this question because Stranger Things was recently in the news. We almost talked about this today. Some episodes in the new season, I believe the finale is going to be over two hours long. So, Tactic, you will start. 77 minutes. I feel like there's definitely been an episode that's an hour and a half. I'm going to say 90 minutes. You kind of gave me a short window there before, like, otherwise I'd have to plus one, yeah. I'm going to say 90 minutes. He gave you a very short window. You might even say... Not a window at all. Tactic, the longest episode of Stranger Things is 77 minutes long. (laughs) That's weird. Well, I'm glad I didn't waste that plus one. That's very uncanny, though. How did you know that? That's a Stranger Thing right there, (laughs) is what I would say. Okay, so Tactic on the board. If if we didn't have, if we haven't been doing this for a long time and like had a set format, I'd be inclined to give you a bonus point there, but I'm not going to. How many children auditioned for the show? This is tough because I feel like a, there's a lot of roles for kids. And also, what is the cutoff for kids? And I don't like do extras audition. If you're thinking I'm have I'm, I'm not gonna in give, possession of any of this information, yeah. you're not going to get it. So I feel like they can't waste too much time on trying to cast people. But I'm just thinking of like all of the movies and shows where they show like someone going into a casting room and how many people are there for one part, even if it's a bit part. I'm going to say 15,000. So this was like a low budget under the kind of didn't really know. They just kind of picked a bunch of kids randomly. I'm going to say one. Tactic on the board again. uh, It wasn't one, but it wasn't 15,000 either. 1,213 child actors, 906 boys, 307 girls. It doesn't feel like Uh, enough. Well, I think Tactic made a great point. This show was a little bit under the table when it started. Not under the table, but like under the radar is what I meant to say. So there you go, Tactic. two Two to nothing. Uh, Nerd Bomber, you gotta you gotta get on your horse here. Okay, so season one became kind of a smash hit. When season two came out, it was obviously much anticipated. According to Netflix, how many people streamed the entirety of season two in just twenty four hours? This was two and a half. Uh, this was no, it wasn't two and a half million. This was four hundred and ninety seven thousand people. It's definitely more than that. I'm going to make you feel bad and do your original answer of two and a half million. 361,000. Guys, this would be hard to Are do. you serious? I think you'd have to just watch it nonstop for 24 hours. I got close. Tactics still has two points. <laughs> Nerd Bomber, zero points. So Nerd Bomber, you got you to gotta clean up here. If there wasn't busting, I would have well, won. Well, I don't think one. I can win now, right? He got three right. You, you can. No, I got two right. No, he got, 
He got two right. He busted that time too. You guys both busted. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. You can get both of these right, but Tectic still has his plus one. So you're in big trouble. Here's an interesting question. How many lines does Millie Bobby Brown's character 11 have in season one of the show? I feel like this isn't a lot. This could be a trick question. I don't know if she even talks in the the first season. Five. Six. (laughs) Tectic takes this one home. 42. She does talk, but it's pretty... She talks sparingly, I would say. The the glaring daggers I got from that. (laughs) So, so, Nerd Bomber, let's do the last question for fun just to see if you can recoup some of your dignity. In season two, we see Hopper's cabin for the first time. How much did it cost for the production team to buy for the show? This was a steal. This was a, this was, they bought the house outright and they got it for $180,000. $180,000 and one. Well, Nerd Bomber, it's not your day. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. One dollar. So you both busted. That's a steal. I knew it was a steal. It caught. Co- yeah, it cost him one dollar. I don't really, again. I don't really have any of the details. I just that's that's what I'm reading. So, Tectic, congratulations. That brings you to first place. Seven, seven and six tied for first place with your boy. That's me. Uh, Nerd bomber five and eight. You got a hill to climb. And uh, Stephen, want to know? Stephen will be joining us next week, and hopefully the rest of you will be joining us next week for another fantastic, incredible, action-packed episode of the Online Warriors podcast. We thank you so much for joining us. If you are so inclined, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Hit us up on Twitter at the handles we mentioned, at OWLegal86, at OWTactic, at OWNerdBomber, our main show account, at Online Warriors one Check out our Patreon. And in the meantime... Okay. Well, bye. Have a good week, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody.